I thought I would introduce our first speaker by speaking about how he and I were first introduced. When I was in undergraduate studies, there was a very tall freshman sitting in the front row of a liberal arts core curriculum class at the Rochester Institute of Technology. And in this class we were reading things like Kurt Vonnegut, so not a real classical curriculum as such, but you know, speaking about what we thought about the readings. And here this uh, freshman I didn't know in the, in the front row with his baseball cap on would frequently raise his hand and contribute to the classroom discussion, usually with a sentence beginning, C.S. Lewis says. <laughs> So I look, I look next to me at my friend Todd Duncan, who was also in the class, and who is this guy? <laughs> we got to invite him to our biblical Greek class on Saturdays that we go to. And so I came to know Ted uh, as someone who had been formed by his Christian experience, uh, who had been raised Episcopalian, considered himself an Anglican, and. Uh, you know, was a, a religious person in a, a very secular environment. And so if you had told me 17 years ago that Ted would be at a small university in Rochester speaking about Christian history in England, I would say, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> Everything in our own history forms us and, and leads us to the moment that we live each day. And so that is uh, how I came to know Ted, and I have been so impressed in his apostolate of teaching, to which he has dedicated himself. He's not only a great biblical scholar, and, and certainly he, he has uh, some bona fides in that regard. Uh, his uh, degree from Notre Dame uh, gives credence to what those of us who know him already know, is that he knows his stuff. But not only is he someone who knows the scripture and history, but uh, what so impresses me about Ted in his approach to his apostolate and the, the people that he has conversations with, relationships with, is his great desire always to apply to the practical business of living the Christian life, our history, our tradition, our inheritance, and how God still speaks to us today, especially through the Holy Scriptures. And so, um, with that, please welcome as our first speaker today, Ted Yanishevsky. scheduled this conference um, what was it was it one or, or two dozen times uh, <laughs> but through happenstance and the accidents of history uh, the conference happened to fall on November 12th which would have been the 75th birthday of uh, David Higby um, David is the man In the 5th century, the Roman army pulled out of Britain to go fight on the continent. 
soon after hordes of Angles and Saxons and Jutes poured across the channel and conquered the east and south of Britain. At least that's what Bede says in his history. Scholars for the past couple of generations have made something of a cottage industry out of denying the traditional account. There is no evidence for the alleged Anglo-Saxon invasion, except the mythical and unsubstantiated reports of pre-critical historians like Bede. If you've opened a textbook written in the past 50 years, it probably told you that there was only a very small migration from the continent, and that the native Britons just all started speaking <coughs> old English one day, uh, influenced by elite dominance mechanisms uh, or something. This was, that was the consensus anyway, until earlier this year when Nature Magazine published a massive study analyzing the DNA of hundreds of skeletons in Anglo-Saxon graveyards to quote one of the authors, and this is from last month. There's been this ongoing conversation in archeology span for quite some time about the nature of the migration. Is it a mass migration? Is it an elite migration? Was there even a migration? Perhaps it is an invasion by elite warrior males. And what this study does is it completely changes that conversation. What it says is, yes, there is mass migration. You can't argue with that anymore. Huh. In other words, it turns out B was right. <laughs> so that's the lay of the land. Britain has been overrun by warlike Germanic pagans who reckon time with uncouth day names like Woden's Day and Thor's Day, who know nothing of the cross of Christ. What's to be done? Who will tell them? The mission to the Anglo-Saxons famously begins with St. Gregory the Great in Rome. And here I want to let me take over. They say that one day, when some merchants were newly arrived in Rome, Gregory followed the crowd to the Forum to see their wares. Among other things, he saw some boys for sale with pale skin and comely countenance and beautiful hair as well. And he asked where these youths came from. And they answered that they came from Britain, where such was the appearance of the inhabitants. And he asked whether the people of that island were Christians or were still entangled in pagan error. They said they were pagans. Then this good man sighed heavily from the bottom of his heart. Alas, said he, it is a sad case that the author of darkness should possess so bright and comely a people, and that men with such a fine exterior should bear minds devoid of inward grace. Then he asked the name of the people. They answered that they were called Angles. And he said, a fitting name, for they have also an angel's face. It is only right that such men should inherit with the angels in heaven. And what is the name of the province these youths hail from? They answered, from the realm of the Darians. Really, said he, well are they called De Irens, being plucked from the wrath, De Ira, of God, and called to the mercy of Christ. And what, what is the name of their king? It was answered, his name was Ela. To which Gregory replied, Alleluia! The praise of God the Creator must be sounded in those parts. Now, did this really happen? <laughs> uh, I like to think so. Um, what we do know is that uh, as soon as Gregory became Pope, he sent the most capable man he knew, the prior of his own monastery, to bring the gospel to England. And so the monk, Augustine, gathered some of his brother monks and began to travel north. And in the words of Alban Butler, the powers of hell trembled at the sight of this little troop which mar marched against them, armed only with the cross. They made it to the North Sea and got onto a boat to cross the channel to pagan England. There were about 40 of them, including some French interpreters. In less than one year, Augustine had converted the King of Kent and 10,000 of his subjects. How? How could he do this? The ground had been prepared by the queen, St. Bertha, 
who had come over from Catholic France. The love of a good woman. <laughs> Augustine himself returned briefly to France to be consecrated archbishop, and in the years that followed, he converted two more pagan kings, including the king of East Anglia, uh, Joseph. He built countless churches, mostly on the sites of old temples and groves, and he founded a monastery in Canterbury, named, of course, for St. Peter. And he ordained the first three bishops of England in London, York, and Rochester. Augustine died in 604, just seven years after he was consecrated archbishop. At his death, the faith had a solid bridgehead in the east and south of England. But there was a lot of work that still needed doing. So we proceed to the next great figure to work the fields of Catholic England. And this is one of my favorite saints. Uh, and not just because his name uh, is Theodore, although that doesn't hurt. <laughs> this figure strides into England as from the pages of a fairy tale. The kind of person you could never put into a novel. His existence is just too improbable. No one would ever believe it. Only in history books can you get away with a character like St. Theodore of Canterbury for the simple reason that he was real. Theodore was born in the year of our Lord, 602, in the city of Tarsus in Syria, over here. You see that? His first language would have been Syriac, learned at his mother's knee. As a young man, he would likely have gone to school in the great metropolis of Antioch to learn to read and speak and pray classical Greek. But then in the 630s, Theodore left Syria and moved west. Why? What happened in the 630s that might make a man want to pull up stakes and leave Syria? The heir of conquest. So Theodore left for Constantinople, where he studied science and philosophy, astronomy and medicine with the most educated men of the Christian East. From there, he proceeded to Rome, where he entered the Greek monastery of St. Anastasius. There Theodore learned Latin and was instrumental in the overthrow of monothelitism, his name even appearing alongside St. Maximus' confessors in the Octa of the Lateran Synod of 649. It's just amazing. So that's a pretty full life, right? You know, he's traveled great distances, met and befriended saints and scholars, and upheld the truth of the Catholic faith. We come to the mid-660s, Theodore is an old man, comfortable in his library, amid his books, feet up, enjoying retirement. Meanwhile, in England, the see of Canterbury becomes vacant. The man named Wigard is selected to be the next archbishop. He journeys to Rome to be consecrated by the Pope, but then Wigard gets sick and dies. They've got no one to replace him. What are they going to do? And somebody says, I have to imagine as a uh, sort of joke, <laughs> why don't you send Theodore? <laughs> Theodore? Ridiculous. He's 66 years old. Theodore. Theodore, did you hear that? He says I should make you Archbishop of Canterbury. Sure, I'll go to England. <laughs> I know, right? Ridiculous. Wait, what? <laughs> if, if they need me in England, yeah, I'll go to England. Sign me up. Wow. <laughs> We uh, weren't expecting that. Okay, Theodore, um, you've got the job. There is literally no one more qualified in the entire world. So Theodore is consecrated archbishop. And he gets on a donkey, and he travels north, learning English on the road. And this man was a dynamo. He hit the ground running, appointing bishops, hosting synods, traveling constantly. One of the English bishops, St. Chad, in his piety, insisted on going everywhere on foot. And there's a story that Theodore picked him up with his own hands and put him on a horse. Because we haven't got time for that. Time is short. We've got work to do. This was the age of the Heptarchy, when England was carved up into seven warring kingdoms. But thanks to Theodore and his indefatigable labor, the church in England became one, one in doctrine.
doctrine, discipline, and liturgy. And Theodore founded a school in Canterbury with his friend, St. Adrian, a fellow refugee of the Arab conquest who hailed from Libya. And they drew in the best and brightest young minds from across Britain, and also a number of, of Irishmen from across the, uh, the Irish Sea. And Theodore and Adrian poured into them all the wisdom of the East, as B writes. A crowd of students assembled around them, and to his minds they daily poured rivers of wholesome learning, such that they gave their audience instruction in metrics, astronomy, and computus, the calculation of Easter, as well as in books of the Bible. A proof of this is the fact that some of their students are still alive, who know Greek and Latin as well as their native English. Never were there happier times since the English first came to Britain. When Theodore finally died, he had served as Archbishop of Canterbury for a gobsmacking 22 years. And the England he left behind was the brightest star in the constellation of Northern Europe. Finally, I want to consider the founding of the monasteries at Wearmouth and Jar Jarrow, where the Venerable Bede would spend his days writing the story of England. And that brings us to St. Benedict Bishop, Benedict was a Northumbrian of noble birth who left the world for love of Christ at the young age of 25 and traveled south to Rome and elsewhere on the continent to France. Uh, a total of five times in his life, each time bringing back to England the treasures of Christian Europe, manuscripts by the cartload, music, pictures, relics, French masons to build the first stone churches in England, and Roman cantors to teach English about monks to sing like the angels, as Bede puts it. He works so zealously that we are freed from the need to labor in this way. He journeyed so many times to places across the sea that we, abounding in all the resources of spiritual knowledge, can as a result be at peace within the cloisters of the monastery with secure freedom to serve Christ. But by far the greatest treasure that Benedict brought to England was St. Theodore. Benedict happened to be in Rome when Theodore was consecrated Archbishop of Canterbury and was entrusted by the Pope with bringing this Greek monk safely to his see. Benedict was the man who taught Theodore to speak English. In 674, Benedict was granted land by the king of Northumbria in whose court he had once been one of the thanes. And Benedict built a monastery at Wearmouth, up there. Which he named, of course, for St. Peter. On that same land, very possibly in that same year, an Englishman was born, and his parents named him Bede. We don't know the names of Bede's parents, but we do know that as, as far as he was concerned, his father was Benedict Bishop the abbot of his childhood. As Bede says to his fellow monks on their founder's feast day, January 12th, now we are his children, since as a pious provider he brought us into this monastic house. We are his children, since he has made us to be gathered spiritually into one family of holy profession. Though in terms of the flesh we were brought forth of different parents, we are his children, if by imitating him we hold to the path of his virtues, if we are not turned aside by sluggishness from the narrow path of the rule that he taught. There were other guiding lights in Bede's life as well. Eight years after the founding of the abbey at Wearmouth, the king offered the monks another grant of, of land at Jarrow, where Benedict, it's about six miles away, where Benedict built a second monastery named, of course, for St. Paul, Benedict placed it in the capable hands of St. Seelfrith, who would succeed him as abbot upon his death and who doubled the size of their library. Not long after, a plague struck the abbey, and according to an anonymous life of Seelfrith, at one point there were only two monks left who were capable of singing the office, the abbot, of course, and a certain young boy. <coughs> There can be little doubt that this was Bede. 
Up to this point, we've talked about the plowing and sowing and watering of the fields of Catholic England. Now I want to talk about their coming to full flower in the person of St. Bede the Venerable, or as he's usually styled, the Venerable Bede. Bede is the only Englishman placed by Dante in the Paradiso, in the circle of those flaming ardent spirits whose meditation made him more than man. William of Malmesbury accorded him the title Doctor Anglorum, Teacher of the English. He was, in his lifetime, the most brilliant man in Europe, according to the greatest modern Bede scholar who died just last year, George Harden Brown. Bede, oh, that's sorry, there he is. Look at, him. Look at that guy. <laughs> All right, Bede stands at an eminence on the landscape of the eighth century. There is no other writer as a scholar Bede is supreme. In Europe, no contemporary matches his talents and influence. If we leave behind Europe and survey the whole of Christendom, it's generally agreed that the only man in the world, in the world, who was Bede's equal was St. John of Damascus. As Bellarmine puts it, Bede illuminated the West with his wisdom as the Damascene did the East. So what do we know about the life of this great man, this great sage of the North? Almost nothing. It's funny, we did, uh, we did an All Saints Harvest Fest uh, a couple weeks ago. Imagine 40 little kids dressed as saints, stuffing candy in their mouths and chasing each other around the yard. It was wonderful. Uh, anyway, thanks to the, the timely loan of a Benedictine robe by Kate Dominguez, the Venerable Bede was in attendance. <laughs> And so I'm thinking, what do I tell them about B? All right, so I sit in the lawn chair and uh, with a stack of books on my lap, and I pretend not to see the kids coming. Uh, I'm reading a book, and I say, oh, oh, I, I didn't see you there. And one of the kids says, what are you reading? I said, this is one of my books. I got here early, so I, I thought I'd check and see uh, how many of my books Ted has in the library. And I'm kind of disappointed. Only 13. <laughs> and uh, one, of the, one of the little ones pipes up and said, did you write all those books? And I said, this year is only about a third of my books. And he said, wow, are you Joseph Pierce? <laughs> tell a kid about me, right? In his entire lifetime, he may not have traveled more than a mile or two from his birthplace. At most, some scholars posit a trip to York. Bede spent a happy, quiet lifetime in the cloister, reading, writing, praying, and worshiping God. So I told the kids a legend about Bede that folks used to tell to explain why he's called the Venerable. He is, he is a saint. He's always been a saint, right? But his title is just the, ben the Venerable. Just an English custom, right? Okay, but but there are legends. Why why is he always the venerable bead? <clears throat> when I grew old, I went almost completely blind, and one of the boy monks decided to play a trick on me. He led me out to a stone gully near the monastery and said, "Here's your congregation, bead, uh, brother bead. Uh, they're they're ready to hear your homily now." So I preached my homily. To the rocky ground. Meanwhile, the boy is over there sneakering to himself a little twerp. Until, he's laughing, until I finished my homily, at which point the stones replied, Amen, <laughs> venerable bead. <laughs> that shut him up. <laughs> wow, did that really happen? I don't remember. Why, it was a long time ago. Take some candy and get out of here. <laughs> About the only thing we do know for sure about Bede's life is what he left us in this little paragraph at the end of his ecclesiastical history of England. Bede, the servant of Christ and priest of the monastery of the blessed apostles Peter and Paul, which is at Wearmouth and Jarrow, who being born in the territory of the same monastery when I was 
seven years of age, was delivered up by the hands of my kinsfolk to be brought up by the most reverend abbot Benedict, and afterwards by Seelfrith. And from that time, spending all the days of my life in the same monastery, I have applied all my diligence to the study of the scriptures. And observing the regular discipline and keeping the day daily service of singing in the church, I have taken delight always either to learn or to teach or to write. In the 19th year of my life, I was made deacon. In my 30th year, I took the degree of the priesthood. And from the time that I took the priesthood until the 59th year of, of, my, of my age, I have employed myself upon Holy Scripture for my own need and that of my brethren. And then he gives us a list of his writings. <laughs> About which a few words must be said. Bede wrote, according to my very rough estimate, about 1.8 million words. His Latin is a delight to read. It's, it's absolutely lucid. Simple without being simplistic. It is the ready and able instrument of his thought. Bede wrote in a wide range of genres, poetry and prose, history and homiletics, science and saints' lives. It is through these writings that you get to know Bede the man. And what strikes you on every page of his works is his humility. His works are not about him. He's not trying to make a name for himself. For instance, a number of his writings were textbooks explaining grammar, orthography, poetry, basic science. But there's nothing glamorous in writing a textbook. These works were written to be of service to his brother monks and to the church. Bede's most famous writings are those dealing with history including his monumental ecclesiastical history of England, from which we've already had some samples. Without Bede, we would know next to nothing about entire centuries of English history. And Bede is a historian's historian, really a delight to work with, in no small part because he always gives his sources, which is almost unheard of among the ancients, like that story about Gregory the Great punning in the forum. Bede comes right out and says, this is a story that they tell, and it's a great one, so I'm including it, right? It's no exaggeration to say that Bede gave England a history. And since the days of Bede, the story of England has been a Christian story and cannot be told without invoking the name of Jesus Christ and the church he founded. But the greatest body of Bede's works is his biblical commentaries, which are fantastic, which I use regularly in my own teaching. The great task of Bede's life was to interpret scripture. And he worked to serve two ends. The first was personal. Each of Bede's commentaries was an act of devotion by which he nourished his spirit by gazing on the holy things of God. The second end was to serve the church. Bede lived in a land that was starving for the word of God and he did his part to bring the scriptures to the English people. To show what I mean, I want to direct your attention to one of Bede's more noteworthy commentaries. Bede wrote a commentary on the book of Tobit. <coughs> why? why? Why Tobit? Because no one had ever written a commentary on Tobit before. Bede's is the first such work in history. It's the same with his commentaries on Ezra and Nehemiah and the seven Catholic epistles. Bede surveyed the battlements of Christian scholarship and went to stand in the breach, where he was needed, not where his works would earn him fame and plaudits. And it wasn't just the subject matter. The content of Bede's commentaries was chosen with a mind to building up the church. Bede was no mere antiquarian, bringing up baubles from the past to tickle curiosity. He understood that scripture is the word of God and it was intended, was given as nourishment for the people of God. So Bede's commentaries are an opening of the larder, a setting of the table for the faithful to eat their fill. To give an example, in his treatise on the tabernacle, Bede <coughs> compares the woven curtains of blue, purple, and scarlet cord to the Catholic church, woven together from all the nations of the earth. The church is not just Angles and Saxons, but Britons too, and Irish and Scots, made one people in the Lord, gathered and waiting 
for his triumphant return. Beautiful. I want to raise a question. Where did Bede learn all this stuff? <laughs> In his writings, he mentions only one teacher, one uh, brother Trumper, who taught me the scriptures. Right? How do you how do we account for the depth and breadth and richness of his learning? He taught himself. He read every book in the Abbey Library. He even taught himself Greek from this manuscript, Codex Laudianus, which you can still go see at Oxford. This is the Book of Acts in Greek and Latin parallel columns. This was probably written in Constantinople in the 500s and brought to England, of course, by St. Theodore. But I ask again, who? Who were Bede's teachers? St. Ambrose, St. Augustine, St. Jerome, St. Gregory the Great. Without leaving Northumbria, this little English monk traveled to Milan, to Bethlehem, to Africa, and to Rome to sit at the feet of the greatest Christians ever to write in Latin. Bede devoured their works and was their greatest pupil before Thomas Aquinas. An interesting historical note, we're used to hearing you know, Ambrose, Augustine, Jerome, and Gregory listed as the four doctors of the Western Church with this, this stained glass window, right? That's, that's, you know, that's the grouping, right? But it was actually Bede, in his commentary on Luke, who first identified these men as the preeminent Latin fathers. The schoolmen in the Middle Ages were only following Bede's lead. His works on the more mainstream parts of scripture, like Luke and Genesis, are shot through with references to his teachers, always with attribution, which is another vanishingly rare thing among the ancients. Bede would always tell you that this is what Gregory says, right? And so some critics are dismissive of Bede's work, calling it uh, derivative or unoriginal. I would prefer humble. And let me add that these critics have somehow overlooked that Ambrose, Augustine, Jerome, and Gregory are incredibly sophisticated in their language and thought. For Bede to read and understand them and present the distillation of their wisdom alongside his own insights and all in the Latin that was digestible to his brother monks was a tremendous achievement. One of my favorite of Bede's works is this one, excerpts from the works of St. Augustine on the letters of the Apostle Paul. Anyone who's read Augustine knows that he was one of the greatest expositors of St. Paul ever to live. Augustine references Paul constantly, and always with penetrating insight to the mind of the Apostle. But these references are scattered throughout Augustine's many works. Augustine didn't write long commentaries on Paul like some of the other fathers did. Enter the Venerable Bede. Bede saw the problem and said, that's all right. I'll write St. Augustine's commentary on the Pauline epistles. And so he sifted through Augustine's works, copied out all the places where he comments on some passage in Paul, and arranged them in canonical order for easy reference. I cannot tell you how useful this is. This little book is worth its weight in gold. But Bede's service to the scriptures was not just scholarship. Take a look at this, Codex Amiatinus, also known as the Jaro Codex. In my admittedly biased judgment, this is one of the single greatest works of art in human history. It is to the Latin Bible what Codex Vaticanus is to the Greek Bible, Codex Ambrosianus is to the Syriac, and the Leningrad Codex to the Hebrew. The single, the single most important witness to an entire biblical tradition. Codex Amiantinus was written around the turn of the 8th century, and Bede was one of the monks who would have been involved in its compilation. It was one of three Bibles commissioned by Abbot Seelfrith. The project took um, just over 20 years, and 2,000 head of cattle. This codex was the only one to survive the Viking conquest and the dissolution of the monasteries by Henry VIII, because they sent it to the Pope as a gift. Thanks be to God. And I repeat, it is the manuscript that comes closest to what St. Jerome actually wrote in composing the Vulgate. 
absolutely priceless. The final weeks of Bede's life are told in a letter from Cuthbert, the abbot of Weirmouth, and Bede's student. Shortly before Easter, Bede began to have trouble breathing. His feet began to swell. But he wasn't in any pain, and so he kept on teaching, as he always had. He even kind of joked about it. I know not how much longer I have, and whether my maker will shortly take me away. Learn quick. <laughs> <laughs> the last day of his life, he couldn't get out of bed. So he spent the morning dictating his last two works, a translation of the Gospel of John into Old English, and a book of corrections to one of St. Isidore's works. As he said, I can't have my children learning a lie and wasting labor on this after my passing. In the afternoon, he asked to see his fellow priests, and he gave away all his possessions. Some pepper, some incense, and a few napkins. And as they stood there in the doorway, sobbing, he made them promise to say masses and pray for him after he died. And he said, it is time for me to return to him who made me, who created me, who fashioned me out of nothing. I have lived long, and the merciful judge has well ordered my life. The time of my release is at hand, for my soul longs to see Christ my King in his beauty. Later that evening, the boy who was with him copying a manuscript in his cell told him he had only one sentence left to write. <coughs> so Bede told him, I'll write it. <laughs> and then the boy told him that it was finished. And Bede said, good, it is finished. You have spoken truly. And then he sang the doxology, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. And when he had named the Holy Spirit, he drew his last breath. St. Bede the Venerable, pray for us. I have put in mind of the saying of our Lord, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. In the remainder of this talk, I want to survey the fruit that would spring from this venerable seed. And in particular, I want to talk about two men who would transform the face of Europe forever. First, I want to talk about the English mission. Starting even during the lifetime of Bede, the English began to send missionaries back to the mainland, to their kindred, the Germanic tribes that had not yet heard the gospel of Christ. As J.R.R. Tolkien writes, it is significant that the continental missions, one of the chief glories of ancient England and one of our chief services to Europe, even regarding all our history, began with Frisia. Charity began at home and spread next to the closest cousins. Now these Frisians, what were they like? I want to share an excerpt from the Heliand, a retelling of the gospel story in Old Saxon epic verse that came out of the Carolingian court early in the ninth century. And interestingly enough, there's clear evidence at several points that the anonymous translator used Bede's commentary on Luke. How about that? So this is the Hellian, the gospel translated into a form that was intelligible to the Frisians and their kindred peoples in northern Germany. The scene, the Garden of Gethsemane. Christ's warrior companions <laughs> saw fighters coming up the mountain, making a great din, angry armed men. Hate-filled Judas was showing them the way. Christ's followers, wise men, deeply distressed by this hostile action held their position in front. They spoke to their chieftain. My lord chieftain, they said, if it should now be your will that we be impaled here upon spear points, wounded by their weapons, then nothing would be so good to us as to die here, pale from mortal wounds for our chieftain. Then Simon Peter, the mighty noble swordsman, flew into a rage. His mind was in such turmoil he could not speak a single word. His heart became intensely bitter because they wanted to tie up his lord there. So he strode over angrily, that very daring thane, to stand in front of his commander, right in front of his lord, no doubting in his mind, no fearful hesitation in his heart. He drew his blade and struck straight ahead at the first
first man of the enemy with all the strength in his hands so that Malchus was cut and wounded on the right side by the sword. His ear was chopped off. He was so badly wounded in the head that his cheek and ear burst open with a mortal wound. Blood gushed out, pouring from the wound. The men stood back. They were afraid of the splash of the sword. That, I believe, is what scholars call acculturation. <laughs> in any event, this was a warlike people up there in northern Germany. They needed a presentation of the Christian faith that was as bracingly muscular as the Heldenzagen they were reared on. The monks who came over from England were more than up to the task. This is not old brother cat file in his garden pressing flowers. These men were spiritual marines, trained and hardened for service, who longed to shed their blood for the cause of Christ. And the greatest of them was a man named Winfred. Like many noblemen, he was sent to a monastery for his education. Unlike most, and in spite of the objections of his father, Winfred decided to stay. Before long, the quality of the man became apparent, and Winfred was elected abbot, which he refused. <coughs> he told his brother monks that God had lit a fire in his heart to preach the gospel in Germany, and he left for Rome to ask the blessing of the Pope. The Pope was quite taken with this young Englishman, and after a short conversation, ordered that he be given some relics and letters to the princes of the region. I have to imagine the Pope expected never to see this young man again. But Winfred left Rome like a cannonball. He crisscrossed Germany, baptizing dozens, then hundreds, then thousands, tearing down idols, building up churches. He wrote a letter to the Pope to let him know how things were going. The Pope called him back to Rome ordained him Archbishop of all Germany, and changed his name to Boniface. Boniface returned to his diocese. Thereafter followed an eternal moment in the history of Europe. It was in a part of Hesse that he had already evangelized, actually, but where the people were stuck at half-Christian. They prayed to Christ on Sunday, and the old gods the rest of the week. And so Boniface took up his axe and walked to the Oak of Thor. His biographer, Willibald, tells the story. When in the strength of his steadfast heart he had cut the lower notch, there was present a great multitude of pagans who in their souls were most earnestly cursing the enemy of their gods. But when the foreside of the tree was notched only a little, suddenly the oak's vast bulk driven by a divine blast from above, crashed to the ground, shivering its crown of branches as it fell, and as if by the gracious dispensation of the Most High, was also burst into four parts, and four trunks of huge size, equal in length, were seen unwrought by the brethren who stood by. At this sight, the pagans who before had cursed, now, on the contrary, believed, and blessed the Lord, and put away their former reviling. Then, moreover, the Most Holy Bishop, after taking counsel with the brethren, built from the timber of the tree a wooden oratory and dedicated it uh, in honor of, uh, of course, St. Peter the Apostle. Boniface also had to deal with the church in France, which, uh, oh dear. The church in France was in sorry shape, and I, I guess this is somewhat understandable. Uh, the French had their hands full, the Battle of Tours, in which Charles Martel defeated an army of the Umayyad Caliphate took place in the middle of Boniface's ministry. A Muslim army made it this far into France. So Boniface worked also in France, doing what little he could. There's a letter in which the Pope chides Boniface for once rebaptizing an entire village. Uh, oh, right, you know? See, the parish priest didn't know the baptismal formula. Uh, what he said was, baptizo te in nomine patria et filia et spiritus sancti, which means roughly, I baptize you in the name fatherland and daughter and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> that was uh, about par for the course for the Church of France at the time. So in France, Boniface worked for reform and renewal, while in Germany he converted and evangelized. He ordained bishops over the newly Christian tracts of Germany and founded monasteries for their catechesis. 
He was constantly writing back to England, asking them, one, to pray for the mission. Please pray. Two, send more monks and nuns. In fact, send anyone you've got. And three, he asked for books. To be specific, he asked them. Well, let me show you. We ask with earnest desire that to comfort our sorrow as you have done before, you should send us a tiny spark from that candle of the church which the Holy Spirit lit within the limits of your province, that is, that you should deign to send across some part of the commentaries which bead that saintly priest and investigator of the Holy Scriptures composed, especially if it be possible, his homilies, which would be useful to us in our preaching, and his Proverbs of Solomon, upon which we hear that he has written commentaries. Meanwhile, we ask that you should deign to send us copies of the works of the monk Bede, that wise investigator of the scriptures, who, as we have heard, but lately shone forth among you like a lantern in the church through his knowledge of the scriptures. A third letter, I beg you to copy and send to me some portions of the works of Bede, whom lately, we have heard, divine grace has endowed with spiritual understanding and permitted to shine forth in your province, so that we too may enjoy light from the torch which the Lord bestowed on you. <coughs> Bede never left the shores of England, but from his tiny cell, the light of his learning shone on the mission fields of Europe. Boniface spent his life working tirelessly for the mission of Christ. When he was almost 80 years of age, he went again to Frisia to administer the sacrament of confirmation to some new Christians there. Instead of Christians, he and his companions were met with a mob of pagans with bloodshed in their eyes. His companions were all for fighting them. I imagine them saying to Boniface, my lord chieftain, if it should now be your will that we be impaled here upon spear points and so on. But Boniface, like our lord at Gethsemane, told his men to stand down. God was offering him the crown of martyrdom for which he had longed since boyhood. According to his biographers, he held this book, the uh, Ragandrudus Codex, uh, above his head when they came to cut him down. And you can actually see the sword stroke, which cuts through the whole book. And they say that it was stained with his blood. But the mission went on, and Europe became Christian. The second figure I want to focus on in the English mission is Blessed Alcuin of York. Alcuin was born the year Bede died, but he studied under one of Bede's students, in fact, under Archbishop Egbert, to whom we saw Boniface addressing a number of his letters. Alcuin had a great, a great devotion to Bede. Note that in the stained glass here, I don't know if you can read it, Alcuin is holding Bede Opera, the works of Bede. And whenever Alcuin mentions Bede, which is frequently, he calls him our teacher. Alcuin was a nobleman, a brilliant student, soon became known as the greatest scholar in England. In 782, his fame had reached France, and so Alcuin was invited to join the court of Charlemagne, being as he was a monk. He prayed about it, and the Lord told him, go. Charlemagne's court was a kind of Camelot, the king had a great love of learning. He spoke fluent Latin, but according to his biographer Einhard, he understood Greek better than he could speak it. And so Charlemagne, in his enthusiasm, gathered together the leading scholars from across Europe. Alcuin <coughs> took his place among them and soon proved himself by far the most capable of the lot. Here's a Tiffany window uh, at Lafayette College with Charlemagne reading a book over Alcuin's shoulder. The members of this courtly symposium would stay up late into the night, reading the classics, writing poetry, and drinking lots of beer. <laughs> that sounds kind of like a Chesterton conference. <laughs> they all had nicknames. For example, Charlemagne was David, his son Louis the Pious was Solomon, Adelhard was Antony, Engelbert was Homer, Einhard was Bezalel, and Alcuin himself was Flaccus, that is Horace. And from their merry ranks, they sent out the leading bishops, counts, and abbots to lead church and state in France. 
I want to note three things for which Alcuin was responsible. One, the perfection of Carolingian minuscule, which is the direct ancestor of the Latin alphabet we still use today. Two, the establishment of the Benedictines as the preeminent religious order in Europe and the foundation of the monasteries that would preserve Western civilization against the depredations of Vikings, Huns, and Saracens. And three, the careful revision of the liturgical books that Charlemagne would later send to all the churches in France. Dom Gregory Dix called Alcuin the final beginner of the Western Rite. So if you attend or have appreciated the traditional Latin Mass, you are a direct beneficiary of this student of the Venerable Bede. I would like to conclude by observing a pattern. This talk has proceeded in three movements. First, the sowing of English Catholicism. We talked about how the faith of Europe was brought to England, and the treasures of Christian Rome and France were laid up in the monastery at Wearmouth. Second, in the flowering of English Catholicism, we talked about how the fields were cultivated and bore fruit in the person of the Venerable Bede. Third, and finally, in the harvest of English Catholicism, we talked about how the English went back to the continent to re-evangelize the lands from which they had received the faith not that long before. I would like to suggest a parallel. We here in America have been sown with the treasures of Catholic England, Chesterton, Tolkien, Newman, Bede. We are right now in this very room cultivating the fields. And we look across the ocean and we see this island in a sorry state. The churches are empty, the leadership mediocre. And a generation has arisen that has not heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we have, we must return to our island home with the harvest of our faith. We must re-evangelize England. At the beginning of this talk, I mentioned David Higby, who gave me my love for England. Before he died, David told me a dream he had when he was a young man. He saw a little English village on the North Sea. It was summer. Evening, a group of boys were splashing in the surf, and he heard a voice. Will you suffer them to lose their heritage? Will you suffer them to lose their heritage? <laughs>